Thanks for joining us for our trout fishing tips for the Lower Mountain Fork River. Today we're going to be going over kind of a brief breakdown of the river itself, talking about where the public access areas are, um, what to look for when you're there fishing, and some tips and tricks to help you be successful if you've never been there before, or maybe you have, you haven't had much success, and just looking for a little bit more information on fishing down at the Lower Mountain Fork. So brief little overview of the river itself. Um, it is a year-round fishery. It's a tailwater controlled uh, body of water that comes out of Broken Bow Lake. And it is one of, it is the only area that we have where we do have known reproduction of fish. Um, outside of flooding, uh, the tailwater control usually stays fairly similar, unlike the Lower Illinois, which is used for a lot of hydroelectric and so there's generation and release schedules that would inhibit uh, reproductive activity uh, success so in the mountain fork uh, while it gets stocked once every couple of weeks just like the lower illinois and is stocked all throughout the seasonal uh, trout fishery you do have a lot more carryover the water temperatures stay a lot lower uh, we don't deal with the same water quality issues that we do at the lower Illinois as far as a uh, year-round trout fishery. So it is a unique opportunity in Oklahoma to fish for trout in more of a natural trout environment where you get some wild fish, which means fish that uh, were stocked in there that were able to reproduce and then their offspring and any offspring of that become wild fish of the river as opposed to carryover fish that um, were reared and raised in a hatchery. So a lot more uh, trout information to go for the lower mountain fork than we do for most of our other areas because we're dealing with a more of a combination fishery than we are anywhere else where we're strictly targeting carryover and just seasonal hatchery raised trout. So there is some more technical elements to the mountain fork that just don't exist on some of our other um, water bodies. So I'm going to just start off kind of going through what the public access is around. So the mountain fork does have something for everybody. Uh, there are opportunities to fish where um, there's easy access very nearby where the parking area would be, uh, as well as easy terrain to be able to comfortably sit and fish with bait off the bottom or for light wading experiences where it's not um, too rough or too high of flows, too deep of water, too unstable of terrain. So there's lots for everybody at the Mountain Fork. And there's also the opportunity to really kind of get into some more of the rugged sections, um, either through hiking or through wading uh, to areas that are less crowded and see a little less pressure. But overall, the Lower Mountain Fork is a heavily pressured river, um, which means things like fly fishing, where you really are trying to be a lot more um, exact with your presentations. Uh, you'll find a lot more difficulties at the lower mountain fork than you may at like a lower Illinois or one of the seasonal trout fisheries. These fish see a lot of lures, a lot of bait, um, a lot of foot traffic, a lot of pressure in the water on just pretty much a daily basis. So um, in order to be successful out here, especially if you're new to the sport, new to the area, um, we're going to kind of guide you through how to at least be able to get out there um, foot in the right direction, get some bites, have some opportunities for success. And from there, you can kind of grow your trout fishing experience at the Mountain Fork River. So the first uh, link that I'm going to throw over here, and because we're just discussing the Lower Mountain Fork, I've included in the chat already um, some how-to videos that we've previously recorded this week that kind of go a lot more in depth into fishing with bait or fishing with artificial lures or fly fishing if you want kind of a more um, in-depth of some of the lure selection and bait selection and flies that we're going to talk about in this presentation but we're not going to go too in-depth this is more about getting you comfortable uh, with the layout of the river what to look for um, for success and where you can publicly access the water body so i'm going to start up at the very top which is um, at the base of broken bow dam that's the link that i just threw in there they're going to be uh, Google map links uh, with a pin so you can kind of get a little bit of a layout of what we're talking about if you want to click on those or you have the ability otherwise you can always come back uh, and rewatch the videos when they're recorded and click on those links in the chat bar. So here up at the top of the spillway um, just a little background 
we had some major flooding back in the late 2010s um, that basically re-sculpted the entire river and um, very in particularly the spillway. We lost an area that was known as Lost Creek, which was a small diversion um, down where Spillway Creek kind of turns and really becomes the Lower Mountain Fork River. Um, we lost that. So we're basically stripped down to bedrock. We had two major floodings, one um, around Memorial Day and then the other one about six months later in December. And we were releasing historic number or gallons of water in cubic CFS. So a um, lot different composition. If you were been to Mountain Fork 10 years ago and you went back today, um, you'd be, uh, be a bit surprised. But the river has kind of come back into its form in the last few years. Um, it's really defined its new channels and really created a, a pretty cool experience throughout the spillway. So if you utilize this top area, Right there, there's a nice parking area and you can fish the pool that's right below the base of the dam. That's a great place if you want to do anything, fly fish, artificial lure, um, or you just want to pop a seat on a bucket or a lawn chair. It's going to be good, easy access just right there at the base of the dam where you don't have to go far. And that's going to be a heavily stocked area. You're always going to be able to find some fish that are in there. From that, you can either take trails um, and wade downstream and along the stream side but it is um wouldn't say it's treacherous but there are certainly sections that caution um needs to be taken uh, on whether you're walking on the stream bed what walking the edges or you're up on one of the trails that kind of follows deer trails and human trails that have been beat down that follow the river as it goes along you're gonna have some pretty uneven terrain um it's a very primitive uh, ground. So something to pay attention to that when you get there, it's a pretty steep elevation drop until you get down to the bottom uh, where the creek turns. But there's great fishing in through there. It's lots of real quick pocket water. Um, not a lot of big, long runs up through that section like there used to be. They've been broken almost entirely in half. You have many waterfalls, a lot of natural barriers, but it creates a pretty unique experience to be able to target um, some bigger fish in small water. It is faster moving water in these sections. You're really going to look um, to swing flies or uh, utilize artificial lures outside of just at the base of the dam. Not really going to be the best uh, fishing environment to set up to fish with bait. So if you're looking to use power bait or eggs or corn or something like that, um, you're going to have a little bit more difficulty finding areas that are suitable for that setup. Um, and then as well as trying to keep fish, you're going to have to be hauling them. So catch and release or the, the spillway Creek, you know, is mostly fished for catch and release just because you're fishing it on the move. You can go all the way down to the base. Um, you can walk, 259A road back up. It's a pretty long walk. I've done it a few times when I've hiked farther down the river and it got dark than I thought I was going to go. So you have a few routes to get back, but otherwise you're probably just sticking on those trails. Um, and like I said, you, if you have a full day, you can walk it. You can walk the entire Creek all the way down to the corner where it meets the first 259A bridge. And you could walk the road back up to your car. Or if you go there with two people and you have two vehicles, you could park yourself a little shuttle service at the bottom or at the top and choose which direction you wanted to go. So when you do get down to the bottom of Spillway Creek, where it kind of makes its corner turn and, uh, and turns into the mountain fork uh, river right there, is going to be the new 15, uh, 259A bridge. And there's a great new parking area. So looking at uh, at the map here where we have our new bridge, I'll put a kind of a parking point. It's not, doesn't really show the new gravel parking lot through there. It's still a pretty old photo. So this area has been kind of clear cut through there when we had the flooding and there's a nice parking area and there's some good, easy bank access just right there. Again, it's a great place to set up if you want to bait fish right there underneath the bridge is a really good kind of slow, long run. Um, that's great for bait fishing as well as where the uh, creek turns right there at the base of the hill and takes kind of a 90 degree turn. There's a couple of slow holes with easy access for people who don't have waders who um, 
aren't planning on making big long walks through the river. They just kind of want to find a couple of spots where you can set up a chair or, or a bucket and, uh, and bait fish through that. So those are going to be your, your first two kind of points from there. There's lots of access. Um, it is a state park. There's campgrounds. Um, I'm going to focus on the, uh, kind of the main access points, which are going to be the, the three bridge crossings are going to be the major public access, especially within the park right there. So this is what, uh, prior to the flooding has always been referred to as evening hole. Um, and that the water that's back through that is actually a really good section. Now it took a little while for it to come back into form as gravel was moving around, basically all of the sediment that was washed out of rock, out of uh, spillway creek when it hits the big bluff wall there at the bottom it's got to turn 90 degrees so it was basically just depositing all the debris and um cobble and sediment and everything else that came down and it pretty much deposited it right there and it's been working throughout the last several years of our fisheries staff down there moving dirt around um creating these parking lots and and making it more accessible for people to fish again and I was down there uh, about a month ago and was really impressed with how well that stream bed has come back in that area. So there's some really cool opportunities to fish for trout in all three facets, whether you're using bait, artificial lures or fly fishing. That's a really good section again um, with very easy access. If you're going to uh, access it at the bridge. Um, that second bridge at the evening hole and go up, you are probably going to need to have um, at least muck boots on and you can walk kind of a trail around the gravel bars and fish all that good section that's through there. Um, if you are on foot, you're kind of limited to right there around the bridge. Um, on the uh, south side of the bridge, you can walk up that bank to back to the east towards um, Spillway Creek for a couple hundred yards and fish it uh, with just regular shoes or boots on. I mean, it's gonna be a little muddy, but you don't have to get in the water right there. And there's some casting opportunities through that. And then as the river kind of makes its big horseshoe bend through there, you're gonna have access through all the campground areas in there. And then the next big public access spot is gonna be parking right there um, at the river floats and the, fly the new fly fishing shop that's there. And that link to that spot is now in the chat. So those are kind of what's considered like the upper section of the river. It's it's fairly shallow um, through that, which means it's it's pretty much weightable across in in all the sections. Um, it doesn't really get deep, but as you get below um, down river of the float shop and of the fly shop, the river widens. The current slows considerably and you end up with some pretty deep water um, where wading can be limited to just near shoreline. There will be some areas where you can make crosses, um, but as it continues to go down and then there's one more uh, low water kind of crossing right there at a beach area, and I'll throw that um, map dot in right now. And, the, and then everything downstream of this, is just really wide open. So as you go down this, it's a trout area all the way downstream to the Highway 70 bridge. So it is an expansive piece of water. As you get below the, this last 259A bridge, um, you're gonna come into territory where you're gonna find fish that have the opportunity to grow to pretty substantive sizes. Um, lots of good habitat for bigger fish to hang out down here, start feeding on um, bigger prey sources, especially brown trout, feeding on smaller rainbows, feeding on the, all the bait fish, the chubs, the shiners, things like that that are in the river. So, but it is um, as far as like weightability, if you're just going for the first time and you haven't been there, um, this is where the river gets pretty technical as far as looking for certain types of um, runs and seams and structure just because it widens out and it gets so deep that a lot of it looks very similar um, as you go downstream now your next down your first public access downstream of those bridges is going to be at um, 
the first dam that you come to. And that's going to be within the Acorn Campground at the State Park. And you can park there. Uh, you can park right where this map dot is coming into the chat bar. And you can, there's a pretty sub, uh, substantial trail system that runs along the river. And you can walk down that for quite a ways. From there, you're going to have to go downstream um, a pretty long distance from there to your next public access site, which is going to be down at Mountain Fork Park. And Mountain Fork Park, again, is right below a dam. Um, so there are some opportunities to sit there and do some bait fishing where you have some nice, long, deep pool run action. And you're right there near your parking area. You don't have to go very far. But you do have the opportunity to wade down through that. So from the Mountain Fork Park downstream quite a ways, you do have some smaller water. It gets back into where you can do some uh, decent type wading. Um, there are more typical trout looking areas where you have some tail outs going into pools and your runs, um, some pocket water, some couple different channel breaks and things like that, where there is more definition to what you're visually seeing through the river. So going downstream quite a ways on that, you can get into some pretty good wading access. Um, and that pretty much does it for what you're looking at. So the majority of the trout fishing takes place up within the state park, really in between um, the dam and the last 259A uh, bridge on the river. That's where the majority of uh, the crowds and even some of your guide services, that's where they're going to utilize. You just have the most amount of access immediately right there on the water. And there's just good numbers of trout that are in through that. The section below the 259A bridge down to the first dam um, is still fairly fishable, but it does back up immediately downstream of that dam. You have pretty good fishing um, for a few hundred yards where it's pretty defined and then it gets really deep, channels out again and goes downstream into almost a mini lake before it hits the Mountain Fork Park and your low water dam there. And then you get more kind of a trout stream um, makeup just downstream of that. So those are your big public access points if you're going there. Um, so let's kind of talk about what the fishing experience is like when you're there. So like I said, when you're down in the camping areas, um, in that camp, in anything in between the 259 bridges, there's going to be ample access, whether, you know, you're whatever age you are, whatever physical ability that you have, there's going to be something for you in that section. Most of the spillway Creek is going to be for a lot, you know, it's, it's going to be strenuous. Um, there's going to be hazards um, lots of hiking, faster water. There is deep water. It can be dangerous. Um, that water during the flooding, it stripped everything down to basically, you know, the bedrock. So you do have a lot of real slick areas um, when you're stepping on those stones that are going across. They can get some vegetative buildup on them um, and they can just become very slick, treacherous. And that water is just pumping through that canyon with waterfalls and some deeper water. So when you're out there in the wintertime and it's really cold outside and it's cold water, you really need to take caution, especially when you're wearing waders in that section, because you can get yourself into trouble fairly quickly um, if you're just not prepared to be in that section. Once you get down <coughs> to the first 259A bridge, <coughs> the canyon flattens out. Um, walking along the stream bed is fairly level. Um, there's not much in the way of elevation drop, so the water slows down considerably. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they also, the, the water itself is just it lower um, in volume. It's not going to push you through as quickly. <coughs> there can be some little tight sections that will pick up speed, but mostly you're dealing with water that's no more than thigh high, you know, waist, waist high at the max. So <clears throat> you have a lot more control when you're out there waiting. And this is typically where most of the people are fishing out. So if you were to come to, <clears throat> if you were to come and fish this area from this, uh, Spillway Creek down to those 259A bridges, what you would be looking to do, um, where you're gonna have just the most success right out of the box. Like I said earlier, we do have wild fish that are in here. If you're looking to fly fish, I encourage you to stop by the fly shop there. Um, they're going to be able to give you some inside knowledge on 
what bugs are best <coughs> at the time of year that you're there, uh, what they're seeing success with. Um, like I said, the, these fish that are wild, they're going to get way more keyed in to more of their natural environment than fish that have recently been put in um, to the river that are going to be more reliant on what their food source was when they were raised, which was going to be hatchery pellets, fish food, things like that. So fishing off the bottom with some type of bait like power bait or um, salmon eggs is going to reward you the quickest. So that's where we'll start is showing you just kind of the basic setup <clears throat> for uh, trout fishing with bait if you go to the mountain fork which is just going to be a basic bottom rig <clears throat> and what you're going to need is very small hooks to start so size 8 up to size 14 the higher the number the smaller the hook this is a size 14 treble hook and this is a size 10 salmon egg hook so this is what you're looking for if you're looking to keep your fish now you have to remember if you're going to the mountain fork river the entire stretch of river that is designated as a trout area is barbless hooks only so any terminal tackle that you buy is going to have barbs on it you're going to have to pinch those down so you may be better inclined going with a single barb hook or a single point hook because that's just one barb to pinch as opposed to having to pinch down all three. You're going to need a pair of pliers. You just want to want to put them on to your hook just like that. And then you're just going to squeeze down and just kind of work that hook back and forth a little bit and then kind of twist the handle so that you're pushing that barb towards the turn of the hook to bend it in. And then once you get it debarbed, you're good to go. So regardless of you take a treble or some type of salmon egg, mosquito, octopus hook, just something that's just a small, short shank, thin wire hook that's size eight to size 14 is gonna be perfect. And what you're gonna be looking for for your trout rig setup is something probably medium action. Um, you could get away with medium light, six, eight pound test. There are some bigger fish in the mountain fork. So where I usually suggest going with four or six pound test, the mountain fork having six and up, six, eight, 10 pound test is gonna be fine. And you can do this two ways. You can either tie, if you're gonna use a single point hook, you can tie the hook on first. If you're gonna use a treble hook, you need to put your weight on first. Either way, you're accomplishing the same thing, but you're gonna put your weight, so a casting weight in the mountain fork, because of the way that the river runs and where you would set up, um, ideally on the bank situations, either at the dam, or at any of the bridge crossings where you're able to kind of fish downstream and hold current, more than likely a quarter ounce weight is going to be plenty. If you can go lower than that, one eighth ounce, um, three sixteenths, uh, that's even better. The lighter weight, the better when you're bait fishing for trout. So we're just going to put that on the main line and then you get your hook and you're going to tie your hook on. So whatever knot you like to tie, tie on your single point or your treble hook. And after you've tied your hook on, you're going to take a piece of split shot, as small a piece of split shot as you can find. All we're looking to do is find a piece of split shot that is big enough that that eye hole on our casting sinker cannot pass over it. So we just need it. And in most cases, all pieces of split shot all the way down to some of the smallest sizes are going to be big enough to block um, your casting weight. So you would just take your piece of split shot and you put the line through the middle of it press it down get some pliers give it one pinch secure it onto that line and from there what that's going to do is it's going to determine our depth off the bottom so all it's serving as is a stopper for our casting weight and depending on how far you put that piece of split shot away from your hook from that eye hole is how far your bait's going to be up off the bottom so typically about eight to 12 inches, maybe up to like 16. You really don't need much more than that, but about eight to 12 inches is perfect. So something where, where your uh, piece of split shot, you know, something that's about right there. And what's going to happen is you're going to cast that out. You want to be casting it 
straight downstream or 45 degrees downstream, depending on where you're oriented, you're going to probably want to have a rod holder um, or a stick that you can find where you can prop up your rod because it's really important to keep your line tight to your rod tip. And what you'll do is you'll cast out downstream, let it fall down to the bottom and then engage your reel. So whatever type of equipment you're using, spinning reel, spin casting, bait casting, however you need to engage your bail to lock it. You're going to slowly reel up so you can feel that weight on the bottom. And what's going to happen is, is that weight's sitting there. As you get tighter on your rod tip, it's going to slide down until it meets your stopper, which is your piece of split shot. And then your line should look like that as it comes up out of the water and goes to your rod tip. You want it nice and tight. Um, and then what will happen is your power bait or your egg or your marshmallow has floating in it. And it will rise and it will sit up off the bottom just like that. So that's what we're looking for in a bottom bouncing setup. They sell lots of different types of, uh, you know, bait choices, but sticking with something really simple like a power bait paste or some type of floating, what's labeled as egg, salmon egg, just anything that's a floating. But these are usually your two easiest. If you're going to go with the power bait paste, which is typically what I would use if I was bait fishing, there's no preformed mold. So like with a marshmallow or a salmon egg, all you're doing is just working it onto the hook to completely cover your hook. Uh, with the paste, what you're looking to do is just get a little bit on your fingertip. And if you're using a single point or a treble, you're just going to take that. You're going to press it up against one side of the hook to get it off of your finger. And then you're just going to work it around like Play-Doh until you've covered, completely covered the hook in some type of egg shape, teardrop shape, oval shape. And that's all that you need. You don't want, you want to try to avoid getting too much power bait. You want just enough to cover up your hook. If you're putting it on and it's more like this as opposed to this around your hook, what's going to end up happening is that fish is going to come up and Either A, it's going to get it into its mouth. You're going to go to set the hook and there's so much bait on it that when you go to set the hook, the bait itself serves as an inhibitor to your hook point actually coming through and catching the mouth and you pull it straight out of the fish's mouth. Um, what else will happen is you'll be getting bites and because it can leverage one side of the bait, it's going to end up creating a crack in the bait by pulling it from an angle where it's not has, doesn't have the hook point um, in an advantageous position to be able to set the hook. And so what it'll do is it'll just peck at it and it'll eventually just pull that power bait off before you ever had a chance to even set the hook. So just enough to cover up your hook and you're going to be perfectly situated to do any type of, um, you know, bait trout fishing at the mountain fork or really anywhere that you go. The biggest thing is just trying to get yourself in a spot, typically a little bit towards the tail out sections um, of current. You don't really want to be throwing where the river is pumping right into you because what ends up happening is you're going to cast out. The current's going to be way too strong. Um, the big thing about this setup is that by using a piece of split shot or even a very small swivel could accomplish the same thing. The great thing with this setup is when you're done, especially if you're using a single point hook, you can just simply remove your uh, piece of split shot and then you can pull the weight down your line and it'll actually just pull right over your hook. And then you can secure your hook to your rod and travel without having a big weight on it that could damage your rod or damage other things in however you're traveling with it. Um, but the big thing with trout is unlike your bass or your catfish, when you bait fish for them and they typically inhale the bait um, and then your line is just swimming off away from you because they're bigger sized fish. They typically aren't really paying attention as much to that immediate small pressure that they're feeling from being able to carry their line. A lot of times when you're fishing with for those types of species, you're using heavier weight. You have a little bit more slack in your line already so that that fish can just pick up the bait, engulf it and go. With trout, they have these conal shaped mouths. They have to bite on that bait to get it to the back of their throat. And so the one thing we don't want them to feel is the pressure of the weight. We don't want that weight pulling back against the bait. So by having it on a casting sinker like this, you actually see the slippage so it's able to pull that bait 
and the smaller that split shot, the better. It doesn't actually feel any of the tension. And so it's able to bite, 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 and for you to have enough time to be able to actually go and set the hook. So that's really the easiest way um, that you can just get right out of the car, go catch some fish by bait fishing, and that's going to be effective anywhere where you go to trout fish here in Oklahoma. Um, but with the mountain fork going with some type of bait, you can experiment with power bait colors, salmon egg colors, marshmallow colors, flavors, scents. Typically, it's just find something that is a little flashy, um, something with some sparkle in it. Um, corn is popular, the corn flavor, the corn scent, um, lots of garlic scents, rainbow colored, nymph purple. Um, I've had success with all of them. I don't favor one over the other. Uh, so it's really just more about your setup, more so than like the actual bait color or scent itself. You're just trying to get yourself situated that when that fish comes to bite, um, you're putting yourself in the best opportunity to be able to actually take advantage of that bite, set the hook, play the fish, land the fish. Um, so, but just remember bar barbless hooks. So for our artificial lures that are going to be pretty effective out there, uh, again, these are going to be treble hooked baits. There's a couple of things you can do with some of them, like your super dupers and your shaved metal baits. Uh, spoons, slabs. I prefer gold. Um, if you're going to just get straight out of the box and utilize a metal bait, one eighth to one sixteenth ounce um, in some type of gold. Super dupers, 501s, 502, 503 sizes, gold, a little bit of flash to them. But every single one of these baits has a treble on it, but they're also on a connector ring. So you can actually remove this treble hook if you wanted to from this ring. You could replace it with a single point hook and barb that hook. You could also buy barbless hooks and replace them. Or you can just take like we did with the terminal tackle and you can just go ahead and pinch all those barbs down. Um, but make sure that you're using a good heavy pair of pliers that if you use forceps, smaller, like what you're using for trout to remove the bait and you try to get it out of there, um, you may not have enough force to really be able to bend over um, that lure. So definitely want to make sure you're doing that now that we have the entire river as a barbless section. Inline spinners are not uh, most of the time, especially like an actual rooster tail wardens, Yakima bait rooster tails. You're not going to be able to remove that treble hook. It's a part of the entire setup. So with these, you would have to pinch the barbs. But these are going to be your go-to colors. If you're getting rooster tails, you're looking for an olive gold flasher or some type of brown with a gold flasher. These two, an eighth of an ounce or a sixteenth of an ounce. If you're going to use a sixteenth of an ounce, you're going to be looking at using some type of light action rod or a medium light action rod, no more than six pound test. It could be fluorocarbon or monofilament, doesn't make much of a difference. Um, but you want to make sure you're using two, four, six pound test with the spinning setup. Because if you go and try to throw the sixteenth ounce or something smaller than it, and you're using eight pound test or even six pound test, but on a medium action rod, and the tip is not soft enough to load this very light bait to be able to throw it, what you'll end up doing is you'll throw, your line will jump off of the spool, and you'll get those dreaded bird's nest, line twists, all the problems that you know cause headaches on a day of fishing. So if you want to throw the real light ones, the 16th ounce and smaller, really want to be looking to have a setup that's a light or medium light action rod, six pound test and under. Now, the eighth ounce are a great intermediate for everything. You can throw these with medium action rods, medium light action rods, light action rods, six pound test, eight pound test, 10 pound test. You're going to be able to throw the eighth ounce a little bit better, just a little bit more weight, and you're not going to have the jump. Um, if you're using spin casting equipment with the buttons and you try using the 16th ounce, most of those um, come pre-spooled with 10 pound test on them and they're usually medium action rods. You try to throw something too light instead of getting the line jump that you would normally get um, with an open face spinning reel. Instead, what's probably gonna happen is you're gonna go to throw it and it's gonna throw it straight down. 
Um, it's just not going to have enough to load it to throw. So when you come through, it's just, it's not going to go anywhere or it's going to throw it straight down into the water or the dirt. So pairing these super light deals with the right type of equipment is going to put you on more fish more often um, just because you're going to spend less time dealing with problems with your equipment and you'll spend more time in the water. With all of these lures, the shaved metal ones and the inline spinners, what you're looking to do is always position yourself from a downriver orientation so that you can cast upriver. You want to be looking to cast about 45 degrees upriver and cross current. And with the shaved metal ones, like our super dupers, our spoons and our slabs, these ones, because they don't have a blade on them, it's not as important uh, when you get them going. You can actually cast them a little bit farther upstream. You just need to be reeling fast enough that you can keep up with the current. Um, other than that, it's going to be flashing and moving depending on what type of swivel or how you have it tied on or how the bait itself was made. Um, but it's accomplishing the same thing. And what it's doing is it's allowing for your bait to be in the strike zone longer. So if you're fishing the area of the mountain fork up above or in between the 69 bridges, you're really dealing with water that's typically less than four feet deep. There are some holes and runs in that section that are going to have deeper water, but by and large, you're dealing with water that's typically less than waist deep. So utilizing 16th ounce lure presentations is perfect because you can keep that right in the middle of the water column. And with an eighth of an ounce, you can speed up your retrieve a little bit but you're going to want to try to keep them up off the bottom with those trebles. They're going to grab pieces of grass or sticks or other fishing line that's down there. So the goal of all these baits is just to keep them right in the middle of the water column for as long as possible. So by throwing 45 degrees upstream, you close your bale, you begin to retrieve just a steady retrieve. You're just trying to keep up with your bait. And when they hit them, you're going to know it. Uh, each of these baits, Fish is a little bit differently. They're going to have a different sensation on the rod tip uh, with these super dupers being a shaved piece of metal. They allow water through. They're on a half swivel, so it doesn't allow them to fully rotate. So it rotates them back and forth. When they come out of the package, they're going to look something just like this. But you can pinch them down to the metal and create a faster, tighter wobble and a faster fall rate as less water is being exposed to the metal. Or you can widen them by pulling that band out. And that's going to create a slower fall, more water resistance, and you're going to get a much wider, um, kind of more elongated wobble. Typically, taking them straight out of the box when they're like that is going to be plenty. Um, and you're just going to straight retrieve them. They're going to feel the lightest of all of the baits. Now, something like a spoon is going to be your second lightest, but because of its shape, it is going to catch more water resistance. You're going to feel more of a pulse coming from the rod tip. And then the slabs are going to be the heaviest, and you're going to really feel those the whole way in. Now, with the inline spinner baits, the one key difference when you're throwing these upstream, when you're throwing them 45 degrees up, is that the blade, because it is an inline spinner, is meant to rotate around the shaft of the entire lure. In order to create that, it needs tension from the pulling side, so from the retrieval side. So if the current is moving faster than you are retrieving, what's going to end up happening is that blade is going to get sucked into the body and it's going to kind of do this on the way in and it's not going to be effective. So in order to keep that from happening more often than not, when you cast it upstream, all you're doing is when it hits the water, snap your bail. And when you start to retrieve and uh, start to reel, give it a quick hook set. Um, it doesn't need to be like a full on fish hook set, but snap your wrist with the hook set in whichever direction that you're oriented with your cast. What that's going to do is it's going to apply immediate pressure to the end of the bait that you can then catch up to with on your reel. And it's going to get that lure spinning. So with these inline spinners, you should always feel just a constant vibration on the rod tip. If you're not feeling steady vibration on the rod tip, more than likely it's because you can't, you didn't catch up to the blade, the blade's not spinning, or you have line wrapped down around the treble. What also could happen is if you're using way too heavy of equipment and line test that you can't actually feel the bait itself because there's not enough sensitivity with the rod and with the line. Um, it may be working, but you don't feel it as well. That's why it's important to try to pair when you can these lighter lures with the proper rod and 
line poundage just so that they it's easier for you you can feel you have more feel and so you miss less bites you feel more structure you start to get more in tune with the differences between you know a fish strike the bottom uh snags anything like that but those are going to be your key baits i'm partial to a 501 or a 502 super duper it's got a little metallic plate on it it's called prism light they also sell them in gold where it's just straight like that on the front with no flashing sell them in silver chartreuse trout patterns same goes for this all the metal baits and the inline spinners there's a smattering of different color spreads that you can have but if you're just looking for something very basic <clears throat> tried and true that gets bit a lot sticking with gold metal baits or some type <clears throat> of naturally colored inline spinner browns olive greens blacks and whites those are really good starting points um, but those are kind of the key things to remember when you're fishing and like i said with the mountain fork <clears throat> if you're looking to fly fish <clears throat> there's always some tried and true basics that are out there for fishing um, Wooly buggers, kind of think of wooly buggers like uh, <clears throat> you would an inline spinner. Uh, <clears throat> we're just looking to match natural, <clears throat> natural colors. Um, so wooly buggers, uh, streamers, minnows, articulated uh, flies that you can swing, fishing them in similar manners that you would uh, the artificial metal baits. 45 degrees upstream, allow them to swim. The reason that you don't want to fish either fly fishing or with artificials casting downstream or at least cross current is what happens is that current's going to push your lure downstream so fast. And with the tension to your line, it's going to raise your bait all the way up to the surface eventually. So it gets it out of the strike zone. We want that lure down near towards the bottom or middle of the water column is for as long as we can get it to come in. Um, the quicker that it gets higher up in the water column, the less likely you're going to get a trout to come up to get it, especially when it's moving upstream. So fish that live in rivers are looking to receive food from upstream. They're looking to ambush from downstream positions. So when they have baits that come buzzing by them from downstream upstream, not only is that a pretty unnatural presentation for a bug or for a bait fish to be swimming that fast up into the current, you're just less likely to get something to chase from behind it. So they're really looking for food that's coming kind of down at them or cross profile. So when we cast upstream, you're allowing to stay in that fish's uh, vision for longer periods of time, which leads to more bites, which leads to more fish caught. So that's really the key thing. Um, but with fly fishing, if you don't stop by the shop, you just stick to your basics when you're out there. Wooly buggers with, you know, uh, rubber legs. If you're nymphing, pheasant tails, prince nymphs, so real small, size 16s, 18s. You're going to get caddis. You're going to get mayfly hatches. But because there are wild trout, because people that work in the fly shop down there are on the river every single day. If you are going to fly fish when you get down there, and if you fish anywhere, anytime you go fishing in a new spot, you always want to stop by wherever the local bait and tackle shop is, especially when it's right there on the river, because they're going to have up to the minute information on what's going on. And they could help you out a lot more for that. But from a reactionary and a bait fishing standpoint, that's not going to change much throughout the course of the year and throughout the course of time. So sticking with the principles of bottom fishing, small hooks, eight to 12 inches off the bottom, utilizing a casting sinker, really easy setup. Anybody can do it. Um, just put you on fish a lot more often. Sticking with simple eighth of an ounce, 16th of an ounce metal baits in a gold profile, maybe with an orange or a red flash mixed in with it inline spinners natural colors from there once you start catching fish you can start expanding out now the mountain fork down below 
the 69 bridges where you start to get into that wider, deeper water, you might look at targeting some type of quality fish by utilizing a much bigger bait profile, something like a Rapala shad, um, some type of jerk bait, small, slender minnow bait, something you might use for like a walleye or pike or sog eye. You may look to utilize baits like that target aggressive rainbows, big brown trout, throwing bigger flies, uh, large articulated flies that are tied onto like bass hooks, one aught, two aught, three aught flies. That's where you're, if you want to just target specific quality, um, th that's going to be the area to do it in, is down in between those re-reg dams where that water widens out. You can get to a little bit deeper. You can throw a bigger profile bait. But for all intents and purposes, you can still catch the biggest fish in the river with the smallest bait possible. You just can't catch the smallest fish in the river with the biggest bait possible. So I'm a big advocate of always downsizing, um, utilizing baits that get you bit more often by more fish, just allows to, to build within the sport, um, build that confidence to where you can start finding those areas of the fishing that you really enjoy the most and then kind of tailor your fishing experience from there. Um, if you haven't been to the mountain fork before up at the top of the chat, I did include our trout angler guide that has, uh, information on all the trout areas in the state of Oklahoma, along with helpful information that you may need. If you've never been to a place before, like bait and tackle shops nearby, where to camp contact information, things that are just going to kind of help, um, enhance your trip down there. So we got about 15 minutes left here. If you have any questions, please put them into the chat. And we'll address them. Um, when it comes to the mountain fork, really the biggest thing is that understanding it's a heavily pressured river. You're going to run into a lot of um, other anglers, especially if you're fishing in and near the bridges. Uh, those are just the easiest public access spots to get to. If you're an adventurous angler, uh, if you like to get a hike in, you know, with your fishing, I really encourage you to check out the, the Spillway Creek area. You can either park down at the Skyline Trail at the first uh, 259A bridge and walk upstream, or you can park up at the dam and you can walk downstream. Either way, there's a good trail system on both sides of the river and you're just going to get into some pretty rugged remote areas and you're not going to see very many people and there is an opportunity in that section to catch some pretty gnarly fish uh, they have to live in an environment that is very much different than once you get below the 259a bridge which really slows down you get a pretty quintessential trout stream um, in between those bridges and then as you get downstream of that it becomes more of a technical river where it all looks the same. It's much deeper. Uh, finding fish in those areas can become difficult because they may all be in a very key area. And that's when utilizing resources like the fly shop down there to get some information can be helpful. Um, but the barbless hook thing is, is very important. You don't want to get yourself a ticket because you hastily took something out of the box, threw it on there, didn't think about it planning the trip down to Mountain Fork, you probably want to get uh, your fishing gear together first, maybe barb, debarb those hooks ahead of time in a singular box. The great thing about trout fishing is that you don't need much because all the baits are pretty small. So just like a double-sided tackle box that fits right in your pocket, that's pretty easy. You can load those up with a few metal baits, inline spinners, some hooks and weights, and put a thing of uh, power bait in your pocket and you're good to fish whole bunch of different ways while you're down there and having your hooks debarbed already is going to save you a lot of hassle. It's no fun trying to tie on and do all that work when you're actually on the river. If you've been catching fish or if there's fish rising, if there's a lot of activity, um, the more time you can spend in the water, the better. So trying to eliminate all those little things that you may come across, little mistakes that get made that um, might put barriers to potential future fishing trips. That's what these courses are trying to, to help identify and, and help you get into a better spot where you can get bit more often, which leads to more playing of the fish, more landing of the fish, building that confidence sport or fishing is a confidence building sport. And so, um, you know, a lot of the mistakes that we see for trout anglers is usually the equipment itself 
um, using way too heavy a line, way too heavy of equipment, way too big of lures, um, too big of hooks, especially for bait anglers. The hooks that we show are going to be size eight to 14. Um, when we're out on the water and we see people and we hear, you know, not having much success and you look at a setup and you see that they're using a size one hook or a size three odd hook. Um, that's just a me. That's, that's immediately the problem. Uh, you may be using the right bait. You may have the right setup with your bottom bouncing and everything, but you're just using a hook that's way too big. And that's what uh, the barrier to success was. So we try on these asking anglers to identify those areas um, where you may have those hangups, but if there's anything that we can ever help with. If you receive uh, the link to this video via email, you have my contact information. If you just hopped on, saw we were doing a live feed, uh, you can go to wildlifedepartment.com, go to our fishing resources page, scroll down to the bottom. My information's there. Call, text, or email. I'll try to put you on the best information possible or point you in the right direction to help you have the most successful fishing trip, either by yourself, with a partner, with your family. Um, that's what we're here for. Uh, along with the fishing license, is a trout stamp required? No, we eliminated the trout stamp about a decade ago. So you just need a, a valid state fishing license, whether that's a resident, non-resident, uh, annual, fiscal, one day, whatever. However you did your license, you just need a fishing license to go. Um, no more... No more trout stamp. Uh, we've also changed the limit of fish that you can keep. Um, Lower Mountain Fork was historically a pretty heavily uh, regulated river as far as different regulations that were on the river. We've tried to simplify those for anglers so there's less confusion with zones. We currently just have area one and area two where the regulations are identical except for the size restriction which downstream of the re-reg dam in area two, you're limited to one fish and it must be over 25 inches. Whereas above that, it's just the, uh, the three fish. So however you can get to your three fish limit, whether you're fishing in area one or area two or fish combined, when you're fishing in area three, the fishing regulations are the same. There just is not the size restriction um, when you're fishing downstream in area two. Same fishing regulations, it's just a size difference. Um, you can only keep one over 25. And we hope that that simplifies it a little bit for people. And then we just have asked that it's barbless hooks throughout uh, because we do have not just carry over in the river. Other trout areas, it is not as important to us biologically um, for the health of the fish because they will not survive naturally. Um, even in the lower Illinois, a lot of those fish are going to kick back. We have found trout in Kerr Lake. So they will run with the water temperatures. And in the summertime, those water temps get up above 72 degrees. We can lose fish. At the Mountain Fork, we still have a very pristine tailwater, good oxygen, good water temps throughout the course of the year. Um, the fish are able to have some natural reproduction as long as there is not flooding at the time of their spawning period. There is suitable spawning habitat for them to successfully reproduce. So barbless hooks throughout the um, entirety of the trout area. And that's just for the protection of a species that is now wild and established, even though they are non-native. Um, so really cool mixture of fish that you get down there. Um, you're getting two week doses of stocking. So we always keep a lot of fish in there. So that the, the bait and the, the metal baits, those are always going to work great on those stalker fish. And you're going to catch some wild fish occasionally doing that, but it also gives the opportunity for different types of anglers at different experience levels to have different fishing experiences out there all in a very, uh, you know, short window of river space, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, the size restriction, the 25 inch, uh, what's the general weight of a 25 inch trout? Uh, it depends on the fish, but I mean, to be safe, you're going to say that that fish is, is over four pounds. Um, fish will grow differently, browns and rainbows, and then each individual fish, how they carry their weight. Um, trout are in the sam salmonoid family, so they are a longer, slenderer fish. They carry their weight pretty evenly throughout their body. 
Um, they kind of turn into what ultimately looks like a football eventually when they get bigger, whereas your largemouth bass, catfish, sometimes their length is not indicative of how big they actually are weight-wise because they carry more of that rounded bowling ball shape, whereas a trout will kind of extend that. So you get to 25 inches on a fish uh, in a trout, you're looking at something that is well over four pounds at that point. Um, that could be a fish that's already up into the upper single digits, just depending on how it carries its weight, what time of year it is, how well it's been eating, a lot of factors, but a 25 inch fish is a very big fish. And having a restriction like that, knowing that there are those types of sizable fish that are self-sustaining in this river system, um, that's pretty cool. Uh, you're just, you're not going to get that anywhere else in the state as far as year after year being able to produce fish of that size. Are there any cut lows or cutthroat in Oklahoma? Um, have we ever considered stocking cutthroat? Uh, they're not, cutthroat aren't going to do very well here. Um, cutthroat are of all the trout species, um, one that is very susceptible to environmental change as well as introduction um, with other species. They're typically run out of their own habitat by browns and rainbows stocking them in oklahoma would just be cannon fodder for other species to eat um there might be an occasional brook trout depending on where we get trout from that gets slipped in with the rainbows occasionally but for the most part we're going to stick with stalker rainbows um, and brown trout when we when they're available to get we as the agency only stock rainbow trout we get um, a small supplement of brown trout from u.s fish and wildlife and we have over the course of years gotten them through trades with other states um, when we've we've provided hybrid sunfish to wyoming for example to get um, some brown trout that have been stocked at our year-round best month for catching them uh, trout are cold water species, so winter months in Oklahoma are usually pretty good. Uh, that's why it's our seasonal schedule. But typically, they're pretty aggressive um, in the the early summer months, and then again in the fall months. You can catch them all throughout the winter. The winter time is their typical spawning period. Um, so you're going to have fish that are actively moving around, uh, but really kind of that late fall period trout as a whole kind of tend to go into a gorge period and then again once you get into when the water temperatures kind of come out of the really really cold freeze in the winter but being in southeastern oklahoma that never really comes into play so the mountain fork for all intents and purposes is a pretty good all year fishery um, just because we're pulling really cold water out of the bottom part of the lake but it also doesn't get cold enough in the winter to really lower those water temps to such a low level where the trout get lethargic themselves when you start getting down into the low 40s high 30 water temps mountain fork is going to average you know high 40s in the winter which is still going to provide pretty good fishing so anytime that water temps are in between 55 and 65 but really 55 to 60 that's like prime time trout fishing and the mountain fork holds similar water temperatures to that pretty much year round. But biologically, typically it's the summer months when they're looking to gorge on terrestrial bugs, your bigger bug hatches, they can go after meatier meals. And then again, in the uh, late fall months, you might get a bug hatch, but you can also target them pretty good with um, bait fish imitating, which is going to be your hard metal baits. Uh, jig flies, uh, woolly buggers, articulated flies. Um, that's when you're really going to have success at targeting some of those bigger fish. Uh, how do OK trout react to cicadas? Do they key in on them? Uh, is there a stone fly hatch? Uh, I don't, there's not, a, it, we do have stone flies. I, I, you're not going to see prolific hatches like you would think of like being up in the mountain west. Um, your better bet for targeting trout at our year round fisheries with dry flies is going to be terrestrial bugs, hoppers, ants, foamy bugs, caddis and mayfly hatches. Um, but, uh, as far as cicadas go, I, I don't know. Um, I don't have an answer. I would imagine it's a pretty big bug. Um, you know, stone, stone flies and, and salmon flies, they're still a slender body for those trout to come up and get. But I know that carp key in on cicadas. I don't. I don't know why trout wouldn't as well. But I haven't 
haven't been down there fishing when there's been um, cicadas out and around. I'm mean, usually there in the, the later fall or winter. Beetles, yeah, you could use some type of foam, foam black beetle uh, as well. That would be probably get some strikes on that during the summertime. But with that, that's bringing us up on an hour right here. Um, appreciate everybody being on here. If you ever have any questions, please reach out to us um, up at the top of the chat. There's links to our other how-to videos that we've had. Um, this kind of concludes our uh, virtual trout series for the winter. For 22, 23, we're going to have some live in-person clinics coming up in January and February at our uh, urban fish or trout fisheries here in Oklahoma City and up in Tulsa. We'll be in late January um, in Oklahoma City and again in early February. And then at the end of February, we'll be up in Jinx at uh, Veterans Pond. So you can always check out our events page at GoOutdoorsOklahoma.com. See any upcoming fishing or hunting events that we have ongoing. Um, these are always free. Our in-person courses are free as well. You can always go to our Outdoor Oklahoma channel, click on our playlist and go to Ask an Angler. We have over 30 videos on there, lots of trout coverage, and if it, there's anything else you're interested in. But always reach out to us if there's something that, that's that got you bugged about fishing, you want you got some questions you need answered or you got a particular subject matter you'd like to see covered on one of our asking anglers we're always looking for input on that we're in year three of doing these so um, we're always looking for new topics you can only sit here and talk about bass and crappie and trout for so long so if you got something that you're curious about let us know we'd love to do a segment on it other than that happy holidays to everybody stay safe get some trout fishing in and we'll see you at the next one